Welcome back. I know you're all going to be excited to hear this. This is the lesson you've all been waiting for. Polynomial equations. Now you're not waiting for it because of polynomial equations. That's the more excited than anything else. You're excited because this is going to be like the shortest lesson of the course. It's also not going to have any equations and anything to solve in it, ironically. Until the homework, but that's on you. Okay, so let's jump in and see how fast we can get this one done. All we're really going to do today is recap methods that we can use to solve problems. So, so far we've been dealing with lots of polynomial functions and lots of theorems. Now we're looking specifically at polynomial equations, which basically just look like polynomial functions, but instead of being equal to a, another variable like y or f and x, they're just equal to a number. So they're actually solvable. They're a, a, an equation with a single variable. So let's start by thinking about the different ways that we can find the roots of a function. And I'm going to point out, first of all, that all methods, all of these methods, are all about setting the function equal to zero. So that we don't have a function anymore, we then have an equation. So as an example, um, f at x equals x squared plus 1 is a function. 0 equals x squared plus 1 is an equation. Uh, unfortunately, that particular one doesn't have a solution because plus 1 means x is the root of a negative, so maybe negative 1. Yeah, that works nicely. Okay, so what are the ways that we can possibly find the roots or zeros or intercepts of the equation? They all mean the same thing. Okay, so one way you can do it. By the way, that's supposed to be a little checkbox. I know it looks kind of like a weird oblong shape, but it's a little checkbox and we can use a graph. We can graph and find the x-intercepts. So for instance, if I have this equation, then those values right there for x are my roots. So that's one way I could do it. Another way is I could factor. And I'm going to leave that alone for a second because we're going to look a lot more at factoring in just a moment. Or in some cases, I can just solve the equation. And the most notable way, of course, would be the quadratic formula. It lets you solve for x's in an uh, equation. Unfortunately, that equation only works if you're dealing with quadratics, something in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. And we can see that polynomial functions do a lot more than that. Although surprisingly in the real world, quadratic functions do make up a huge bulk of the real world problems that you might uh, have to tackle. Okay, so when I put it down like that, it doesn't seem like there's really that many options. Of course, factoring is a special one because there are lots of different ways to factor. And those are the things we're going to mention now. I told you it's going to be fast. We're already on the last question. Okay, so what are the different methods of factoring? The easiest method is the common factor, and the one you should always try. Always, always, always. Even if one of the other methods is going to work, common factoring will make that method easier. So always try to common factor first. And I find that students usually are so gung-ho to use other methods, they forget completely about that one. Second method is grouping. That one's not too bad. It's actually the one that comes out in uh, complex trinomials, so we're not going to worry about that. And by the way, um, all these methods were things that you went over in the uh, prerequisite skills lesson at the beginning, so if you need more details on them, go back there. But grouping normally works if there's a, an even number of terms. Usually four, but it has to be an even number of terms. Okay, now we've got difference of squares. Difference of squares. I can spell it, swear it. Okay, that works, but obviously only if you've got two terms and they both happen to be perfect squares. 
so not overly useful in all situations. Then we have simple trinomials. And those are ones where the leading coefficients equal to one. And we saw that you just have to find two numbers that multiply and add to a certain value and factor. And we saw complex trinomials. And that's where a is not equal to one. And then we have to basically uh, multiply the first times the last number. Look for two numbers that multiply and add, just like the simple trinomial. Uh, decompose the middle term and group from there. So that one's the one that actually has multiple steps. And then the one we kind of added this year, which is the factoring theorem. which again is just another way of saying, find something that sets the polynomial equal to um, uh, zero when you plug in a value. So if you plug in a three and you end up getting zero, you get X minus one as a factor. And then you have to, with that one, usually use long division of polynomials. Okay, so this is basically a guess and check method. Guess and check. However, you can limit your guessing and checking by using the uh, integral zero theorem. Or the rational, rational zero theorem. And again, integral zero theorem is if the leading coefficient is one Rational zero theorem is if the leading coefficient is not equal to one. And that really summarizes everything there is for factoring. I mean, not how to do it, but what to, to do. And hopefully you already know how to do them all because we've already covered all those methods. So now that you've kind of got a checklist of things to try and ways to approach problems, I'd like you to try some homework questions again. A um, couple little notes there. Only use technology for number nine. Don't cheat and use, uh, use Desmos to solve everything because Desmos can solve many things or Mathways can solve most things. You actually have to learn how the methods work. And for question number two, the textbook uses little boxes and gives some, some details in it. Uh, most of it is pretty obvious except for this notation right here. And all that means is in the picture, the Y scale is equal to two. So each tick mark you see on the graph represents two units. Um, I think they're all white, y scale equals two, but if it was a different number, they'd all represent whatever. So give those homework questions a try. Let me know if you got any problems. And I will see you in the next lesson, and it will likely be longer than this one. But anyway, have a great day.